Gary. I'm one of the pastors here. How are you doing this morning? Uh, let me try that again. I don't know about you, uh, but if there is still time, uh, they are handing out graham crackers or Jean might cook you something from her Easy Bake Oven if you buy her one. Uh, so that is an option for you this morning if you want to stick around. But it's good to be with you. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to open uh, to the book of Ecclesiastes. If you do not know where that is, either check your table of contents or find Psalms, Proverbs, and keep flipping uh, just beyond that, and you'll find Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We'll be reading in verses 10 through 20 this morning uh, as we continue the series that we've been in for the last several weeks, this life in the rear view, uh, according to King Solomon, who we believe, as best we can tell, to be the author of this uh, letter. And what he has been trying to say, this overarching message that he's been laying out over the last several weeks, is that in the end, life, this life under the sun is a phrase that he has often used, this life without God is a life that is full of vanity. To say it another way, it's a life of meaninglessness. And let me clarify what he means by that is not to say that it's not that you can never find temporary satisfaction. It's not that you can never find a sense of purpose. It's not that you can never find pleasure in this life under the sun. But what he is saying is that apart from God, apart from the way and the intention of which you were created, it won't last. And so he's saying this life is in many respects vanity. It's meaninglessness. And as much as we recoil at the heaviness of that, what Solomon has been saying over the last several weeks, and again, what we'll read this morning is this. He's saying to you and to me, listen, I've tried everything. I've gone before you. I've had everything. I've done everything. I've, I've spent my money on everything. And it's left me empty. It's left me wanting more. And so this morning, uh, we're going to continue with his train of thought, his line of argument. And we're going to look at money and possessions, as you might have cued in with what Gene was talking about. And we're going to find from Solomon's perspective that even money, even possessions, won't ultimately give us the things that we want and the things that we are looking for. And so with that in mind, let me invite you to stand, which is our practice around here, uh, as we read from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 20. This is God's word. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what van advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all, the day, all his days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of, the, of his life that God has given to him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and to rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. This is God's good and true word given to you and to me. May we, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you that it is true. And we pray that your word would not merely inform us now, but that it would transform us, that you would help us to see where we indeed might find meaning and hope. And Father, may you help us to see your goodness, your generosity, and your care for us more clearly than when we came in this morning. And would you, Father, transform us, that we might more reflect the image and the beauty of Jesus as we go from this place into whatever the rest of our day and week holds. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Life is more than a job. 
jobs are more than a paycheck and a country is more than its wealth. Life is more than a job. Jobs are more than a paycheck and a country is more than its wealth. These are the words spoken and penned by author William Dershowitz in his book that I've been recently reading called Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of the American Elite. Uh, and it is a fascinating read, but William Dershowitz writes these words about meaning in life, and, and he does so with a particular burden. He's a former professor uh, at an elite university, at elite university and, and what he began to find was that over the years, uh, the university, particularly higher ed universities or elite universities, they had begun to change their focus. And he began to feel burdened because the modern educational system has changed. No longer is it about what it was founded to be. It was is at one time, at least according to Dershowitz, supposed to be a place where young men and young women could come and they could learn to think. They could learn to reason. They could learn to develop a sense of self, a sense of, and a way to show up in the world and in the end, to leave the world a little bit better than the way they found it. But he says that's different now. Now it's become much more of a place where young men and young women come and they learn a specific set of skills, whether business or finance or law or any other number of things. And they often learn what they can and then they glean what they can. And then they go out into the world and the hope is that they will have learned enough or positioned themselves enough and, to, and been able to climb the, the social ladder, to be able to climb the corporate ladder to make the most out of their life. And, and what they say is the end of all this, the way that we will feel the most happy or the way that we will have the most meaning in our life is that we can acquire the most money as humanly possible. We want to make money. We want to climb the ladder. And this morning, as we look at Solomon's words on money and on possessions, I want to ask you a question. I want to turn the mirror back on you. I've been asking myself this question this week, so I want to give you an opportunity to reflect for just a minute. I want to ask you, how much more money, how much more money would it take, do you think, to make you comfortable? How much more money do you think it would take to make you truly happy? If you're thinking on a scale of one to 10, move you just one point to the right. What about extremely happy? How much more would it take to make you comfortable? truly happy, and then extremely happy all the way to the 10. 10,000, 100,000, 10 million? What do you think? I don't need you to shout out any answers or anything, but uh, according to Fortune magazine, there was at least a partial answer given in some of the surveys they did by, uh, with they interviewed a number of, of members of what is commonly called, or what is called Gen Z, uh, not the youngest generation anymore, but Gen Z, those who were born 1997 and after. And Gen Z said that they believed that they needed roughly $200,000 per year in an annual salary in order to be comfortable. I hear a few chuckles out there and a few laughs because you're like, man, I've, I don't know that I've made that money in my entire life. Uh, but before we do that, before we say, ah, oh, those kids these days, there was a similar study that was done in 2018, but this time it was done by the Harvard Business School, and they were seeking to answer the same question, how much? But they weren't doing it with the Gen Z. They weren't, they weren't interviewing Gen Z. This time, they wanted to ask, survey over 2,000 high net worth individuals, those with at least $1 million in assets and up. And they surveyed over 2,000 people in this interview, and they asked them, how much money would it take to, not, to make you not just comfortable, but extremely happy? How much money would it take you, high net worth earners, to be all the way over here to a 10? And here's what they asked them. A, would it take 50% more of your current wealth? B, double your current wealth? C, five times your current wealth? Or D, 10 times your current wealth. 50% more, double, five times, 10 times more. What do you think the consensus was among high net worth individuals? What is that? Okay. But the consensus among the majority was that 10 times their current wealth is what they believe they needed to be extremely happy. So just for the sake of math, somebody with $10 million would need how much more to be extremely happy? 
$100 million. And they believed that was the, that was the secret sauce. That was the recipe. And so it seems that based on the studies and stats, whether you belong to Gen Z, whether you are a boomer, whether you are a millennial, whether you are a Gen X or wherever you are, whether you have money, whether you don't have any, whether you make $200,000 a year or $30,000 a year, the common thing that we share, according to most research, is this, that we believe that if we have more, life will be better. That if we have more, life will be better. And this belief that you and I share in more, it influences the way we work, it influences the way we save, it it influences the way we invest, and it influences even the way we spend. It's found in all of us. You you may be here this morning, Christian, non-Christian alike, all of us at one time or another have believed, or maybe even today, you still believe at times that if you just had more, a new iPad, an easy bake oven, or $100 million, life would be better. I know I believe that. I know I have believed that. But let me ask you a question. What if the belief in more is actually a mirage? What if it's actually an empty promise? What if what you think will actually give you the thing that you want actually won't do that at all? Well, what we just read and what we're going to explore this morning is, is chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes. Solomon wants you to know that that's not a question that actually needs to be answered. It's already been answered by him. And he says, listen, it absolutely is a mirage. Solomon found out that while there are many good things money can do, and while there are many good things money can buy, what money cannot do and what money cannot buy, uh, money cannot give you and it will not buy you ultimate satisfaction or peace or stability and security. You can't do it. But if we'll listen to Solomon's words, and we, may, we might be able to begin to ask, well, if we all want those things, satisfaction, peace, stability, security, just to name a few, where can we find them? And what role does money have in that, if at all? So if you will, look down with me at your copy of God's Word, or you can follow along on the screen behind me, and look at verse 10 where he begins. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase those who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Solomon opens his argument with this recognition about money, and you can see he pulls no punches, he minces no words. He says this, the more money motivates you, the more money you acquire, the more benefits you reap from that money, then what will you actually want? More of it. (laughs) The more you have, The more you experience a blessing from it, the more you're going to want it. It makes sense, right? It's kind of a logical thing. And he says this, the more you will want it. But here's the caveat he wants you to know. The more you have it, the more you benefit from it, and the more you want it, the less you'll actually be satisfied with it. He says this, your next dollar, your next million dollars or $100 million, it'll never be enough. It'll never be enough. Well, how can he say that? Practically speaking, let's think about this for a minute. The more money you make or the more money you acquire, which enables you to buy nicer, bigger things, uh, you, the more possessions that you can have, the, the nicer homes you can buy, think about it practically, the more you are going to need to maintain those things. That bigger house that you've been panning after, uh, it's going to require a more insurance for you to make sure that it's protected if a hurricane comes. We hope not. It's going to require a larger electric bill. That new car you've been wanting, it'll last for a little while, but eventually you'll want a different one that comes along. That plot of land or that beachfront property that you've been after, the cost to maintain that or to acquire that is going to be exponentially higher. You see, more money and more possessions are always going to be, are always going to require more. And if that wasn't enough, listen to, what, listen to what he says here. He says this, uh, that if you have more, the people who know that you have more, are going to come looking for their cut. They're going to come looking for their piece of the pie. Right? He says, if you have more, people are always going to want their share, whether it's the government wanting their cut for their taxes or whether it's friends and relatives or people coming into your life looking for a handout or a hand up. If you have more, there will always be more to buy, more to maintain, more mouths to feed, more people to keep happy. And so he says, sometimes more isn't always better. 
The more possessions you have isn't always better. But then he expands his idea looking down with me into verse 11 about business. And he says this, when he, when he writes, he says this, that, that there, the advantage of the owner is actually not any advantage at all. So he begins to talk about business. He begins to talk about what it means to own your own business or to be the boss. And maybe you've thought this way. I know that I've thought this way, even though I'm not the boss. My boss is in Cuba right now. So I can say that. And I thought to myself, surely, maybe you've thought this too, if I just climb the ladder, if I just make it to the top, if I get to be the, the big boss, the final decision maker, the one who makes all of it, maybe, maybe not only will I get a bigger paycheck, but I'll get everything that I need. But Solomon says, hang on, pump the brakes, slow down just a bit. Think of it this way. If you are the owner, if you're the boss, what that means is that you're going to have to hire more staff. You're going to have to manage and provide more facilities. You're going to have to sign paychecks. You're going to have to be the one that people look to when they need an answer to everything. They're going to look to you because after all, you're the owner. You're the boss. The buck stops with you. Right? And so Solomon says, listen, being the owner might not be all it's cracked up to be. Yes, you may have more, but not only might your game be net neutral when all of those paychecks start going out the door, but the cost and the stress that comes along with being the boss might not be worth it if you were just punching the clock nine to five, right? It might not be worth it in the end. You see, rather than being on top and feeling like you're on top of the world, you end up being like a man. And I'm from Kansas, so I say this with authority. I'm not from Kansas, but I lived there for seven years for those of you who don't know like a man who goes out on a Kansas windy day and he opens up his arms wide and he's going to go out and he's going to catch the wind and bottle it up for his wind collection. Anybody ever seen anybody do that? I haven't, right? But I'm just saying, it sounds foolish, right? Solomon says, well, if you think that being on top, if you think that acquiring more is actually going to give you what you want, he says, it's like going outside on a windy day and trying to bottle up wind for your wind collection. It's foolishness. It's meaninglessness. It's vanity. Now, I want to say there are some of you in this room or some of you uh, who you've either are in business or you've been in business. You were a business owner. You started businesses. And, and let me say with a caveat, we need good people in business. We need people like you who are starting businesses and managing good businesses and taking care of employees. We need people who are doing good work. And that's not what he's picking on here. That's not what he's saying here. What he is saying rather is this. If you are that, if you're a worker, if you're a laborer or you're an owner, don't set your heart on that thinking that that's going to ultimately satisfy you. Because the more you have, the more you will have to cultivate, the more you will have to shoulder and the more you will have to manage the stress of doing what you do in a way that you wouldn't have to if you weren't the boss or the owner. Again, sometimes more isn't always better. And when I think about this whole idea of acquiring more, when I think about more stuff or the, the idea of this belief that bigger is better, more is better, being on top is better, I thought of the story of a man, perhaps maybe you're familiar with, some of you aren't, but a man by the name of Jordan Belfort. Jordan Belfort was commonly uh, or went by the name after the movie that I wouldn't highly recommend to any of you, uh, but The Wolf of Wall Street. And The Wolf of Wall Street is a movie about Jordan Belfort's life. And Belfort was a stockbroker and a co-owner of the firm Stratton Oakmont in New York City. And Belfort, to put it mildly, was obsessed with the idea of wealth. In his, in his autobiography, he talks about that very thing. He was obsessed. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to be powerful. He wanted to be on top. And he was willing to pay just about anything to get it. I mean, he was willing to pay just about anything because he thought if he just got to here, he would be satisfied. If he just got to here, it would be enough. And so from the time his firm started and over the next five to six years, Belfort and his firm became incredibly wealthy. And I mean incredibly wealthy by human standards. But what he began to find out was that it was never enough. Once he got here, he wanted more and he wanted more and he wanted more. And to keep climbing the ladder, to keep padding his pockets, to be, keep getting more zeros in his bank account, he ended up defrauding some of his shareholders. He and his firm defrauded investors over the next several years in the sum of over $200 million. He took money from people in over $200 million. And yet it was never enough. 
This belief that he had was never enough. And he even gets to the point of having $200 million that he's defrauded from his investors. And what we begin to find is not only the more he got and the more he wanted, but the cost that he was paying was extraordinary. Not only was his professional life literally beginning to crumble around him, but his personal life was as well. Addictions, infidelity, failed marriages, and then eventually 22 months in prison. Saw the the, the man who once thought he could have enough. Saw his world come falling and crashing down around him. Because in the end, more didn't cut it. And this is why I think Solomon would say things like he does in Proverbs 23. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Because in the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. For it it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. If I could say it more simply, one day you have it, one day it's gone. One day you have it, one day you lose it. So what do you do? Is it wrong to acquire wealth? No, some of you have actually made a quite of a good living. Some of you have actually been very good at making money throughout your career. Some of you even today are very good at making money. Is that wrong? No, no. Is money evil? No. Solomon says, acquire it. If you can acquire it, and that is something that God has given you to do, acquire it and enjoy it. It's a gift. But remember that it's a gift. Remember that that it's not yours. Remember that you didn't do it single-handedly. Remember that when you get it, it's not, it is a gift from God. Just don't buy into the mirage, he says, that more is always going to be better. As he says in verse 20, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. If you can acquire money, listen, money can do really good things. Money can buy good things. But Solomon would have you to know that it cannot buy ultimate things like satisfaction. Solomon continues that he says, another thing money cannot do is buy you peace. So I want to ask a question. What does it mean to be at peace? What does it mean to have peace? What does it mean to be at peace or to have peace? I think while the definition may vary, we could survey the room and we probably would come up with at least a, a, a smattering of answers. I think depending on who you ask, like I think all of us, right, we could all agree, yes, that we want to have or we want to be at peace in our lives, right? I don't think any of us were saying, you know what, I'll sign up for chaos. Just give me more of that. If you do, come to my house later. I've got two kids who I can meet. I can take care of that. But the belief that we have or the belief that we're taught is what? Peace will come when you get all the things around you organized. If you just get what you need in your life, you just get the right job, you just get the right money, you just get the right kids who know how to behave, then you'll be at peace. My kids are perfect. I don't know what you're talking about. But but like those who believe that perhaps money can buy ultimate satisfaction, there's also, I think, a belief out there that if we just have more money and more stuff, then we're actually going to be at peace. But Solomon says, listen, if you believe that, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. Listen to what he writes in verse 12. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There was a 2023 article released by the BBC, uh, and the article was titled, Hustle Culture. Is this the end of the rise and the grind? Hustle culture, is this the end of the rise and grind? Maybe you've never heard of hustle culture, uh, but maybe you have, I don't know. But this is how they describe hustle culture. This is how they describe it. Waking at 0400, necking a bulletproof coffee in one hand and a green juice in the other, hooking into a multi-screen desk for a setup of back-to-back calls and strategy sessions, and you're hustling because you ultimately want to build a mission-driven empire and you want to harness the hashtag grind set. Who needs sleep when you're going to make trillions of dollars? In the hustle culture narrative, they continue, promotes the idea that there's always more to strive for, more money to make, a bigger title or promotion to secure, and a higher ceiling to smash. I don't know about you and what I just read, but 
when I read the article in its, in its totality and what I just read there, uh, I got tired. Whenever I hear people talk about hustle, hustle culture, I'm like, man, I get weird. I don't, I don't know how you do it. Maybe you just drink more coffee or something than I do. But I get tired reading the article. But you see, the reality is, friends, this is the reality of the world for so many people today. Hustle culture, working yourself to the bone is not something that a certain subset of people do. It is everywhere. Our jobs, have, have, our jobs demand more. We're more connected, so we're always on. Our responsibilities have always increased. And for what? Because we believe that. We believe that. There's always something more. And that more, we think, will give us something. According to Solomon, though, that's not true. It's kidding ourselves. Pursuing more, longer hours, nonstop grinding, an accumulation, a higher ceiling to smash, a mission-driven empire, it won't bring you peace. It won't. And the lack of peace, it affects everything in our lives, our health, our relationships, and even our sleep. That's what he just said. The stomach of the rich won't let him sleep. In this constant pursuit of wealth and success, he says here about this particular gentleman, this particular man, maybe even speaking about himself, it's led to a sleepless night filled with more worry, more anxiety. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced a, sleeping, a sleepless night where you're tossing and turning because you're thinking about something. Maybe it's not where your next dollar is going to come from, but you're worrying, you're anxious about something. You know that if you've experienced that, that is a miserable existence when you can't get sleep, but you keep looking at that alarm clock, waiting for yourself to go back to bed. Solomon says, listen, if you believe what he's saying here, that's what's going to happen. You're not going to be able to sleep. You're not going to be able, you're not going to be able to stop worrying. And that's a miserable existence. And I wonder, you know, we're noticing this, this BBC article and even larger companies like Google and Amazon and countless others are starting to pay attention to some of these things. And it's almost like the Bible might influence broader culture. Like God actually has some wisdom for us to apply. It's, it is quite amazing. I, I agree, Gene. But to be clear, listen, Solomon's not advocating if you, you maybe I want to be clear. He's not saying to you, okay, well, the answer is just be content. And then contentment leads to complacency. That's not what he's saying. Go back with me and look at verse 12. He says this, sweet is the sleep of the laborer. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer. He's not saying that this life is one where you can just put your arms back behind your head, fold your arms over your lap, kick your feet up. He's not saying any of that. He says, sweet is the sleep of the laborer. The laborer's work in Solomon's mind, it's a hard work. It's a work that tires him out, but it gives him what he needs. It gives him what he needs. And because his heart and his mind aren't fixated with more and more and more, when he comes home at the end of the day and he gathers with those he loves around a dinner table, and then when his head finally hits the pillow at night, his sleep isn't tossing and turning and fretting and worrying. His, sweet, his sleep is sweet. If you could say it more simply, it's this. The diligent work combined with a right view of life and money is peace. Is peace. And so how do we cultivate this kind of thinking? How do we cultivate this kind of life? Well, the Bible specifically, it actually has something to say about this. Look at what Jesus has to say in Luke chapter 12. If you want to turn there, you can, but I, I'm going to read it for us. Luke 12, he says this, if then you are not able to do as small as a thing as that, that is not worry or not acquire everything that you need, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and is tomorrow thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not seek what you're to eat or what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, listen, don't be preoccupied with more because that doesn't give you peace. But what gives you peace is knowing this, that you have a God in heaven 
the God who created you, who is a gracious and generous provider. He will always take care of his children. And I know that's hard for some of us to believe, harder for others than, than maybe in this room this morning, that God will always take care of you. But here this is true. God is not stingy. He's not sitting back with his arms folded, just waiting for you to convince him to give you that little bit. He is a gracious provider. He's not a genie with three, waiting for you to rub his lamp three times and give you three wishes. He's not an ATM, he will all, but he will always provide for you according to his purposes and his plans in your life. And Jesus says, when you believe this, whether you have a little or a lot, you can have peace. And the last thing that Solomon wants you, to, you and I to know is that money can buy you many good things. It can't buy you ultimate security or stability. I recently came across in preparation for this sermon, uh, the story about the life of a man, uh, Howard Hughes. Maybe some of you are familiar with Howard Hughes. Uh, there's a lot of ideas about who Howard Hughes was, so I'm not going to spent all a lot of time on him, but Howard Hughes was an influential American uh, inventor and businessman and real estate investor, and he owned and did all kinds of things. He did more things in his years of life than I, than I will probably ever do in 10 lifetimes. But he was a man who was extremely, extremely wealthy, extremely, extremely successful in what he did. And yet, despite his accomplishments, his life is not merely one that we want to emulate and model. His life is also a little bit of a cautionary tale. Because there's something about his life that, that began to fall apart. Even though he had everything, even though he achieved in many respects what you and I could only achieve in 10 lifetimes, even though his money was excessive, he had conditions like neurosyphilis and OCD. He would often lock himself in his room for months on end. He was so fearful of acquiring illnesses and sicknesses that he created his own purification system for his trunk of his car. He had his own security detail that would follow him around at all hours of the day because he wanted to be safe, because he wanted to be secure, because he wanted to make sure that life would, he would be okay. And I read about his life and it eventually took a toll on him. He would isolate himself and he'd become a recluse and eventually his health began to fail. And I think about his story and how much it reminds us that, listen, you and I want peace, we want, but we also want things like security. We also want to feel secure in our lives. So where do we find that? I think it's part of our God-given makeup. So where do we find it? Well, Solomon would tell you, listen, money and stuff doesn't have any power to actually last to give you what that, to give you security or stability. Listen to what he says in verse 13. There's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, but those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And he came from his mother's womb, and so shall he go again. Naked he came, and, and shall he take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. And this is also a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to to him who toils for the wind. Solomon says, listen, if you set your heart on more, it will cost you. But it won't just cost you. It will actually cost those who depend on you. It won't just cost you, but it'll cost those who depend on you. In Solomon's example, there's a man who was holding on to his wealth. He was obsessed with the idea of having and acquiring and hoarding and making more money. But then something went wrong in a bad business venture. I'm sure in a room of this size, perhaps there's something like that happened in some of, in your life before. Maybe you've lost it in a bad, bad, business, bad business venture or the economy collapses or the stock market crashes and all of a sudden what you had, this much ends up being this much. When you were here, now you're here. And Solomon says, but here's the problem. Those who were depending on him for food and for life, they have nothing in their hand to show. And Solomon says, what you think will bring you security won't actually bring you security in the end. It's an unstable provider for those things. And Solomon says, listen, that's not, there's not just that though, but there's one more thing that we got to talk about. And that's this, in the end, you can't take it with you. In the end, you can't take it with you. Naked, you came into the world is how Solomon riffs. You came in naked into this world. And when you die, you're going out the same way. 
You didn't come in with anything and you ain't going out with anything when your time comes. As a country song says, I, I have to low-key admit I listen to country sometimes. Don't judge me. There's a song by, uh, by artist Christian Bush who kind of talks about this thing that we're maybe familiar with, this nomenclature, and he says, it's a song called Trailer Hitch. You can look it up later. I don't know why, I don't know why everybody want to die rich. Diamond, champagne, work your way down the list. We try, everybody tries, tries to fit into that ditch, but you can't take it with you when you go. Never seen a hearse with a trailer hitch. I could probably pray and just go home right now. And I'm about to. But at the end of the day, it stands to reason if you can lose it in a moment's notice and if your hearse won't, have an, won't be able to hitch up a trailer, it's not going to give you what you want. It's not going to give you the security you seek. So what do we do? Well, looking back to Luke 12, I wonder if this is why Jesus would say, why kill yourself trying to get rich? Why wear yourself out trying to get rich? Instead of doing that, instead of thinking that money is going to give you ultimately what you need, do you remember what Jesus said? Sell your possessions and give to the needy. If you want to know how to have a meaningful life, if you want to know how to have a life filled with satisfaction, a life filled with peace, and a life filled with security, what Solomon might say to you and what Jesus might say to you is this. If you can acquire it, great. If you can make it, great. Enjoy it. Take it in. Enjoy the gift. Enjoy what you have. Enjoy what you have with those you love, but then don't stop there. Consider helping those who don't have what you have. Consider looking outside of your own frame of reference to a world out there who actually have so little and need people like you who have an abundance to make their life a little bit better. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Consider helping those who don't have what you have. Be a person of generosity like God has been toward you. This is how you find a life of satisfaction, peace, and security. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this, this reality when he tells the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 this. He says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, set his power and his place of privilege aside to step into this world. That's what the Bible tells us. And as he steps into this world, he lives this nomadic existence. No home, nowhere to lay his head, no money, no promise of ever gaining anything. In the world's eyes, his life is a tragedy. It's a loss if we measure it according to success and acquiring and accomplishment. His life is an absolute tragedy and a waste. But his life wasn't a loss in heaven's eyes. Not even close. You see, because by him losing his very place of privilege, and by him ultimately losing his life when he died on the cross, what he did was though he gave up gain, he chose a better life. He chose a more meaningful life, and he chose a gain that when he got it and when he acquired it, it elicited the thunderous applause and the rapturous joy of heaven. And do you know what that gain was? You. Me. You and me with him in the kingdom for eternity. And what he says about that is, listen, what's true about that is that what was once Jesus's, if you believe in him, is now yours. His glory, his riches, his inheritance now belongs to you by right if you are a child of God. And what is more, it never loses value. It never rusts. It can't be stolen. It will always, always last. Jesus says, if you want to know where to find satisfaction and peace and security, money can do about this much. But the gospel and the love of God and Jesus can do about this much. So if you can acquire it, enjoy it. And then share it with generosity. But as you do that, don't forget, what's going to give you what you want is Jesus and the hope of life with him forever. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you have given us Christ and thank you that you have given us Jesus. 
Father, I pray that everyone in here would say that they would see that the gift of money and the gift of stuff is that. It's a gift. And I pray that as we acquire it, that we would enjoy it, and then we'd be willing to give it away because we know that the ultimate satisfactions in this life are found only in you. Thank you that you love us, Jesus. Thank you that you are willing to die and set aside your place and privilege to give to us what is yours by right. We pray and we ask that you would take now our continued worship and you would use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.